Hey, today we're going to continue. Oh, I'll just say we do have our first quiz on Friday. Remember, the quiz always covers the same stuff that was on the homework. So, you know, not the same questions, but I'm going to make quiz questions similar to the homework questions. The quiz is not meant to be a big deal. It's just we take the first uh, 10, 15 minutes of class, do the quiz, and then we go on with the rest of class. So that's, uh, that's how that goes. Any questions about it? It's going to be great. Some people have sent me already your, uh, your grading ratios. I appreciate it. Um, I believe the due date for those is a week from tomorrow, so you still have some time to think about it, see how the quiz goes. All right, great. Let's get down to it then. So I want to talk today about slopes and tangents. Um, this is something I just briefly started you know, mentioning last time. If you have a graph, Calculus, in general, is about change, how something is changing, usually over time, but it could be any, any kind of change. Um, and it is a basic observation. When you look at the graph of something, you can tell how something is changing based on the slope of the graph as you go along these points. For instance, right around here, the thing is increasing. And the reason I say it's increasing is because it's going up as you go to the right, all right? Um, whereas right here, the thing is decreasing. All right, I started on page two, okay. Um, and now, sorry. Something's weird with my... Uh, there we go, all right. Um, it's decreasing in that area, all right? Um, and that's because the slope is going down actually fairly steeply at that point, all right? This is sort of a very basic geometric realization about the, um, the rate at which something is changing over time, increasing or decreasing or whatever, is related to the slope along the graph, all right? Um, and what I mentioned at the end last time was that everybody knows how to find the slope of a line. It's just the rise over the run. Um, but what about the slope of a curvy thing like this picture that I've drawn right here? How would you find the slope of that? Well, the fact is the slope is changing as you move across the picture, right? Sometimes the slopes are going up, sometimes they're going down. And um, it's not just a simple matter of measuring rise over run anymore because the thing is curvy. But the best we can do, so to measure the slope of a curve, To measure the slope of a curve, the best we can do is to look at, oh, come on, to look at the tangent line, the slope of the tangent line, the tangent line, and that means like no matter where you are along the curve, there is, uh, say if I want to look right at this point, it's curvy right there, but you can draw a straight line which sort of hugs in to that curve as best as you can. So this is, this is the tangent line. And this is, as far as straight lines which look like that curve, this is as good as it's going to get in terms of trying to measure the slope of the curve at that point. And so when I say the slope of the curve at a, at a particular point, really what I mean is the slope of the tangent line of the curve at that point. All right, the slope of the tangent line. Um, people sort of a long time ago realized that this, um, looking at this tangent line has immediate applications in lots of areas, for example, in physics, because, whoa, sorry, called the tangent line. Oh my goodness, great. Um, this is, I will say super useful in physics that the slope of the tangent line actually means something important. So for example, let's say that I have an object which is moving. And the typical notation for this in physics is um, s of t is a function. Let's say s of t is the position of an object as it moves. 
after time, let's say, t in seconds. All right? So maybe this is like a, a ball that's going back and forth or something. You imagine a, an object which is just moving in some way. All right? Um, if I had, for instance, a, um, like a, uh, a point, let's just say, moving back and forth, back and forth, uh, like say uh, a ball like this, but maybe it's it's like bouncing back and forth between two walls. So just doing like boom, 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 that kind of thing. All right, a, a ball moving back and forth. Um, you could graph its position on a curve. It would look something like um, if it starts off like in the middle. Maybe I count the middle as zero, and then it moves out to the right first. Goes up like this. At some point, it, it sort of gets to the end and then starts going back the other way. It'll actually look something like this, right? As it goes back and forth, it's going to the one side and then goes all the way back to the other side and then back to the other side, back and forth like this, all right? This is one of the, uh, one of the ways that, uh, like this looks like sine of x. This is one of the ways that the sine function arises in nature. When you see something in nature going back and forth, that very often is actually describing the um, the curve of the sine function. Anyway, along this curve, you could actually graph this and measure the slope at any given time here. Like, look at the tangent line right there and find the slope there. And it turns out, in the real world, the slope right here, like the actual slope, the rise over the run, It tells you, um, it represents how fast the thing is moving, right? If it's super, uh, super steep slope there, that means that this ball is actually moving across really fast. Um, and if it's not so steep, it means it's moving slower. It turns out the slope, the rise over run, actually equals the velocity in um, you know, distance per second. If I had, can I say, I didn't actually give units here. Let's say the uh, position in meters, just to be explicit here. If my function represents meters, the position of an object in meters from one second to the next, the slope actually equals the velocity in meters per second. So what I'm saying about like, you know, you can kind of see uh, something relating to how fast something is changing on the graph. This is not just an analogy. This is actually equal to the velocity if you measured the slope, like the rise over the run of the tangent line. It's not like that kind of tells you if it's moving fast or slow. I mean, it does, but actually that as a number, it really equals the number of the, the speed of the object, the velocity of the object. All right. This is kind of, uh, kind of cute, I think. So the velocity the velocity actually equals the slope of the tangent line, right? At a particular point, of course, the velocity is changing from point to point, from time to time. But um, if you wanted to find the true velocity, it is equal to the slope of the tangent line. This is kind of a big realization, and it is um, the basic observation that allows you to take this, this vague idea about how things are changing from moment to moment and translate it into what is basically a geometry problem. You have to figure out what that line is and what its slope is. Um, it sounds kind of like a deep thought, this, this relationship between the, uh, this sort of analytical question about the change versus the geometry of the picture. But actually, it's not so hard to come up with this. And I think that this is something that any one of us could have come up with on our own. Because it, just sort of from a very common sense viewpoint, it makes a lot of sense. So I want to try and convince you why this idea, which is super important, like in history, in the history of you know calculus, but um, is actually not all that. Uh, it's actually, I will say, kind of obvious. Obvious. Um, any one of us could have come up with this. If I, I will try to describe a very specific situation. Let's say I'm driving the car, right? Let's say I'm driving, and after um, maybe three hours, 
I've gone 120 miles. And after four hours, I've gone 160 miles. All right. Now, I didn't show you a whole like function, the curve of a function that describes where uh, my you know, distance for every time. But this is at least like two particular points on such a curve. I said, when the time is three hours, my distance was 120. And when the time was four hours, my distance was 160. Uh, I would like to know how fast was I going? Let's say miles per hour. Any masters of common sense out there? What would you say? 40. 40. Yeah, I mean, just, just by looking at the numbers here, after three hours, it was 120. After one more hour, it was 160. And you can just see, well, how much did I go in that one hour? It was 40, right? So uh, how fast was I going? The answer, just by sort of bonehead common sense, no offense, um, was 40, right? That's how far I went in that hour. So I was going 40 miles per hour. But I will point out, if you really did graph this out, what it looks like is, OK, I have, I mean, at some, at three hours, I'm at this distance, 120, right? So there's a point right there. And then at four hours, I was at this distance, 160. And so the curve, like I didn't show you what the curve is, but it must go from between those two points, right? And any, um, anyone want to want to predict what the slope of that little line segment is? Actually, it is 40. Like whatever commonsensical reason you thought the speed was 40 is actually the same calculation that you would do if you if I asked you to find the slope of this line. All right, because the slope is the rise over the run. The run here is 1, and the rise here is 40, right? That's the difference between 160 and 140. So the slope here is actually 40, right? I'm just trying to convince you that the slope of the line segment is actually the same as the speed of the object, all right? It is, and it's not, from a certain point of view, you might say this is a deep uh, thought or some kind of deep observation about the way that the universe works, but it's not all that deep. I mean, it's just a, a different way of looking at things. You look at this, uh, this, this little calculation that you did in your head to subtract 160 minus 20. That's really what you're doing when you look at the, uh, the rise here on the picture, right? It's the same thing, and it's not, it's not all that deep of a thought, all right? Now, in reality, something that's, that is a little uh, subtle about this, in reality, the car motion doesn't actually look like a straight line, all right? When I'm driving the car, I suppose, unless I had cruise control on for a whole hour, and I was going exactly 40 that whole time, probably not. I know when I'm driving 40, I'm not doing it with the cruise control, usually. Um, more realistically, my car probably looked something like this, right? Like it was not exactly going in a straight line, meaning my speed was not exactly 40 the whole time. At, at times I was going faster, at times I was going slower. It kind of averaged out to 40. Um, so that's one little sort of subtlety here. I'm going to say actually this slope is my average speed over that hour. Right? My average speed over the hour. At, from moment to moment during that hour, I might have been going a little faster or a little slower than 40. Um, that's because, the, why is this not the true speed? The true speed would be obtained by the slope of the tangent line along the curve at any moment. And that's not what we did here. We just took the slope sort of overall between these two points, which is not exactly the same as the moment to moment slope, although you would expect it to be fairly close. All right. Um, here's another uh, more realistic real-world example. I got real-world data here with real data. You can do something like this also, and it remains pretty commonsensical. So on the next page, I preloaded this thing. Check this out. This is real. This is a graph of um, stock prices for IBM, which was a, you know, a, a computer company. Um, this is their stock price over the course of one day. I just I looked this up this morning, September 9th, 2021. This is like last week sometime. 
over the course of one day, the stock price, of course, it fluctuates a lot. And these fluctuations are not according to any formula. This is just how the stock changed on that day. All right, minute to minute is what this is. So you can see a bunch of, um, a bunch of data numbers over here. This is a graph of those numbers, although the, the data on the graph goes all day long, nine to five. These numbers, these are only the ones that could fit on the screen, go up to 945 or whatever. All right. Um, so you can see on the graph, of course, from minute to minute, this thing is fluctuating. It's at some points it's increasing, some points it's decreasing. Um, and uh, if you want to, you could measure at any moment how fast is it increasing, like during this minute or during that minute? How fast is it decreasing during this other minute? And actually, when you see, um, I'm not really a, a, a finance guru, but when you watch, when you, you've probably seen like little stock tickers to tell you the, the stock price, and it has like a little, maybe a little plus one or a minus one right next to it. That, so the, the number is actually what the price is at this moment. And then that little like plus one or minus one or whatever, that is telling you how much it's changing. At this, at this same moment, all right? Um, that's useful information if you care about, about uh, the values of stocks. Anyway, could we ask the question? I would like to ask and answer. Can we do this? Um, how about, how fast was it changing How fast was the stock price changing? Let's say in terms of dollars per minute at exactly 941. All right, now you could try to look on the graph. Really what I'm asking is related to the slope on the graph at exactly 941, which is hard to see on this picture. It's, you know, in here somewhere. I don't, I don't really know what the, what the slope is like that, all right? Rather than trying to draw the slope in there, we can just do this using the numbers, right? We have these numbers in the chart and I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna focus specifically on the numbers right around 940, right? Because this is what I, did I say 940 or 941? 941, all right, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, at, I'm gonna focus specifically at these numbers around 941. Uh, let's look at these, these, these numbers right here in particular, all right? I have 139.68 and 139.73. It means if you were to zoom way in on the graph at that, at that single point on the graph, which I guess is like around here somewhere, I guess. If I were to zoom way in on that, zooming in at 941, looks like I'm just gonna have those two points. So let's say here's 941 and 942, and the value at 941, you can look it up, it says 139.68, so there's some value here, 139.68, all right, and if you look up 942 on the chart, it says, come on, 139.73, all right, so that's slightly higher, that's up here, all right. So I guess during that minute, it increased a little bit. These are, these are not huge amounts, but it increased a little bit. All right. And how would we measure how fast was it changing there? It's the same as the thing with, with my car, really. I mean, you want the slope of this little line segment, right? And this is easy enough to do. Um, if my units are dollars per minute, then the, the uh, run distance here is just one, if I'm measuring units in uh, minutes. All right. And then the rise would be, how much is that? That's this distance here. Yes, I see someone. Yeah. Five cents, is that what you said? I think it's just five. Maybe you saw the numbers wrong. It goes, yeah, 68 cents up to 73 cents. That makes five cents, yes. In dollars, uh, that would be 0 0.05, all right? And so how fast was it changing in terms of uh, dollars per minute? Again, I'm trying to convince you that this, which seems like a complicated idea, it's actually very common sense. It increased by 5% or 5 cents in that minute. So how fast was it changing per minute? 5 cents per minute, right? Or in dollars per minute. So the change was 
0.05 dollars per minute. All right. This is an example where in the real world, people care about these numbers a lot, right? This financial business. People care about um, how something is changing from moment to moment a lot on the stock market. They want to use ideas from calculus to measure that because that's how you measure how things change. This I wanted to uh, bring up as an example of a situation where you want to use ideas from calculus, but there's no formula of anything in this problem. Like if you know some calculus already, you know what I'm, what I'm talking about here is the derivative, but there's no formula to take the derivative of in this, in this example, right? It's just a bunch of numbers. I'm here to tell you, you can still do the same old stuff with those numbers. It, and this is similar to the derivative. But when people say we use calculus in the real world all the time, this is, um, this is a huge way in which calculus is used, so-called all the time in the real world, is not by like taking the derivative of x squared over and over again, but it's about more like doing stuff like this. This is how people use um, measure change in the real world. It's not all that complicated, right? At least. I mean, people, real, pe real people doing finance, they do very complicated things, much more complicated than this. But um, at least in terms of measuring how something is changing from moment to moment, is not all that complicated. All right. Any thoughts about that? This is my little introduction to slopes and velocities as a way of measuring change. All right. OK, that's enough of the real world data. Let's talk doing this using actual formulas. Um, how would you do this? This actually became a major thing like throughout history that mathematicians were working on. So a major line of inquiry in mathematics. If I know some function, if I know f of x, how do I find the slope of the tangent at some particular point on the graph? How do I find the slope of the tangent at a particular point? This was a major, I would say, unsolved problem that people had identified as being important for like almost 2,000 years. That people, mathematicians, were thinking about this, but not really able to do it in general. It's kind of a strange thing about the way that math works. This is something that the most brilliant people in the world thought about for thousands of years and couldn't do it. Um, you know, within the next few weeks, like we here in this room will all know how to do it, even though we are not the most brilliant people in history. They didn't know how to do it. Um, we do know how to do it, and I'm going to tell you. Uh, maybe you already know. Uh, anyway, this was referred to like historically as the tangent problem, and it was like a big deal for a very long time. People didn't really know how to do this. Um, this was regarded as an important problem at least since uh, Euclid which was one of the sort of OGs of, um, of the Greek geometry school around like 300 BC, right? Euclid uh, tried to do some things involving tangents. And it was finally the way, you know, the way it worked is throughout the centuries, lots of people looked at this and people ended up figuring out in very particular examples how to do things, uh, maybe a few tricks for solving the, this tangents problem. Um, they figured out how to do it for, specifically for parabolas and then someone else maybe figured out how to do it for cubics, but just, just in specific examples. Um, eventually this was sort of fully solved by, um, by uh, Newton, Isaac Newton and Leibniz, who are regarded today as sort of the, um, the inventors of calculus. Um, but in, from this point of view, their real, uh, the real accomplishment is they figured out how to do it for basically for any function. Figured a general method 
any function, more or less, all right? Um, and that's the method that we here are going to talk about. And what I'm going to, I'll try and describe Newton's uh, concept in, uh, in a few words, and then, you know, of course, we're going to talk in much more detail about it. The basic idea is um, we consider smaller and smaller time intervals between points. I'll try and tell you what I mean by that. Consider smaller and smaller time intervals. So for example, if I have a function, let's do a specific example, x squared minus x, all right? I graph this on my calculator. It's a parabola that does something like this, all right? This is x squared minus x. Um, and let's find the slope at x equals 3, which on this picture is over here. All right, let's find this slope. Uh, the idea, what I said, is consider smaller and smaller time intervals between points. I'm going to try and show you what I mean by that. Unfortunately, I have to turn the page now. I'm going to try this. I've never tried this before. Let's see if I can grab this thing. What? OK. Oh, all right, forget it. <laughs> I'll draw the picture again. I'm sure that's not too hard to do, but I don't want to figure it out right now. OK, we have a parabola that looks like this. And I'm talking about this point here. All right, find that slope right at um, x equals 3. The idea is, of course, this is not a straight line. The curve itself is not a straight line. So you can't just directly count the rise over the run. You have to figure out what that straight line is first and then measure the slope. And Newton and Leibniz, their basic concept is, let's measure the average slope between two points. This we know how to do. That's easy. This is like the examples that we were just talking about with the car driving or even the stock price between two points. This you can easily do the rise over run. Let's measure the average slope between two points near x equal 3, all right? So maybe I'll go 3 and um, 3.5, right? I could measure the slope between the point at x equals 3 versus the point at x equals 3.5. Or I could measure the slope between 3 and 3.1, or 3 and 3.01, etc. right? I'm going to take the the point at 3 is the one where I'm really interested in, but the only thing we really know how to do is to measure the slope between two specific points. So this is the basic concept. I choose that second point and kind of gradually move it closer and closer to the first point that I like. I'm going to try and draw this picture again, maybe zoomed way in. This is 3. Let's say the curve actually goes through there. It had some tangent line. Maybe I'll draw it in red here. I'm going to try and do this in a way which is sensible. It's hard to draw these pictures. My concept is I'm going to begin maybe by going to 3.5 here, draw this point, and draw the slope connecting those two points. All right? That blue line, its slope is pretty close to the red slope, right? Not exactly, it's not going to be exactly the same. In this particular example, it looks like the blue line has a slightly higher slope, a little bit steeper, right? Not exactly the same as the red. How could I make it even closer? Well, if I move, instead of using 3.5, use another point that's even closer to 3. What about, let's say, I'll go back to 3.1. I hope you can see that color. Yeah. Then that would be like here. At this point, my picture becomes kind of illegible. You can't even really tell the difference between the slope of the green one and the red one. But this is the basic strategy. You move the point. You keep the 3 where it is, but you move that second point closer and closer to 3. And each time, you can actually measure those particular slopes. Let's see if we can do that. So the slope between 3 and 
I want it to the rise over the run. And you'll see actually there's a very simple little formula you can use to compute the rise over the run. The rise would be, you know, in each case we're looking at like triangles like that, right? The rise would be the y value of the second point minus the y value of the first point, which in this example would look like f of 3.5 minus f of 3, right? That's the y value at the second point, the 3.5, and I subtract the y value at the first point, which is the 3. And then this, I divide by the run. Here the run was um, how far it goes horizontally, this distance here, and that in this case is, is 0.5 because that's how far it is to get from 3 to 3.5. Another way to say that is just you do 3.5 minus 3. And this is a, a cute little formula. It's always going to be f of something minus f of something divided by the same things but without the f's, right? This is how this rise over run formula always works when you're using it on a function. And this here you can plug into your calculator. I actually did this ahead of time. I got on the top 2.75 divided by uh, 0.5. This you have to actually plug those numbers in. Remember in this case the function is x squared minus x. So not really easy to plug those in by hand. I use my calculator. And that when I divide that, I get 5.5. So it means the slope of that, like that blue line there, is 5.5. I expect this is kind of close, but not exactly the same as the slope of the red line, which is really what I'm, what I'm after, all right? And then you can plug the next one in also. Three, the, the slope between 3 and 3.1. I also plug this into my calculator. This would be f of 3.1 minus f of 3 divided by 3.1 minus 3. That would be, so when I plug this in, I got 0.51 up top and then 0.1 on the bottom. And this is 5.1, all right? And if you like, you can continue trying this. What about from 3 to 3.1? Uh, I mean, 3.01, I'll tell you. I did this on my calculator too. This is the last one I'm going to do. It's, uh, when I plugged this in, I got 0.0501 on the top and then 0.01 on the bottom, which works out to 5.01. All right. You could keep on doing this if you want to. Uh, anyone want to guess? Do you see any kind of a pattern here? I'm going to say it looks like these answers... Are, are they sort of approaching a particular value? Approaching, what do you say? Let me shout it out. Five, yeah, it looks like they're getting closer to five. As I continue to move that, that point on the right closer and closer to three, it looks like these answers are getting closer and closer to five, all right? And so, we conclude the slope of the tangent is 5, all right? This is, I mean, I hope you uh, can follow what I'm saying here. I will just say this conclusion is a bit of a guess. I mean, it is, uh, I would ask you, are you really sure that those numbers are getting close to 5, like exactly 5? Are you really sure of that? Or possibly could it be something like they're getting close to 5.000001 and you just couldn't tell the difference because we didn't go far enough, right? It is possible that they're approaching something other than 5 and you just can't tell because you didn't do enough uh, calculations, right? But it seems like the answers are getting close to 5. And so um, we're just going to say it looks, like it's, uh, it looks like the tangent line has slope 5 right, because of these little calculations. Um, this is actually the way that people like Newton did calculus back in the day. They, um, nowadays, as a, uh, as a sophisticated mathematician, I would say, technically speaking, if you really think that it, it equals five exactly, you should try to somehow justify that, like, to actually prove it, rather than just using your calculator and it looks like it's kind of close to five. Um, Nowadays in mathematics, people would want to uh, create a proof that it really equals 5. Back in the old days, it wasn't like that, not, not, uh, not for everybody. 
And even today, it's not especially like that for a lot of uh, physics and engineers. Like, all, there are many situations which you just want to know the answer. You're not interested in actually writing a big proof about the answer. You just want to know, is it five or four? Well, it's five. It's not four, right? Um, this is actually, I think, kind of how, uh, how Newton thought about this. Um, we, in uh, modern times, though, and in this class even, we're going to try and go a little bit farther than, than that and actually try and really come up with some, uh, some uh, justification for some of these things that the, uh, the, the original originators of calculus didn't really, um, weren't really able to pin down. All right. So um, what is sort of strange about this is that uh, it involves this bit of calculating closer and closer and closer until you, you just sort of guess the answer. Um, there is a real technical name for that. And this was a new concept when Newton and Leibniz were originally doing this. Um, this requires the new concept of a limit. All right. And this is our first major topic in, uh, in our calculus class. The reason, the principal reason that we care about limits is because they are used in finding the slope of the tangent line, which is really what we're after. But in order to do that in practice, you need to be able to figure out what the limits are. And what I just did about plug it into your calculator over and over again, and then just guess the answer, that's not really a good way to do things in general. We would like a more, a more uh, sophisticated procedure, hopefully not involving using a calculator over and over again, which will let you just figure out what the limit uh, is of some function. All right, let me just try and tell you what the limit uh, of something means. So um, this is different, although it seems the same on the surface, it's different from just asking you what the value of the function is. So if I write, for instance, f of three, this means the y value when x equals three, all right? Everybody knows what f of 3 means. It just means what is the y value when I plug in 3 to the function, OK? But we're trying to talk about things involving the limits. So what I was just talking about with uh, the limit is something like if I choose a number that's really close to 3 but not the same as 3, then what does the function look like? That's the idea behind a limit. So a limit is like. If x is close but not equal to 3, then um, what is the y value close to? All right, this is a different thing. When I just say f of 3, that means what is the y value exactly when x is 3? If I ask you about the limit, what I'm talking about is not what is the value right at that point, but what is the value getting close to in all the nearby points, all right? This is a subtle difference. They really are different, two different concepts. The value at a point sometimes is different from the value of, uh, at the nearby points. Um, anyway, this second thing, you know, the first thing, of course, is written like f of 3. The second thing has its own notation, which unfortunately is quite a bit more complicated. But this is written as this, lim x, a little arrow, 3, f of x, all right? This is how we write that second concept. And when I say it, I say the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x. I have my caffeinated beverage. The limit as x approaches 3 of f of x. All right, what it means, so remember, I will say again, f of 3 means the y value when x equals 3, all right? This limit x goes to 3 of f of x means the y value approached
on the curve of f of x when x is near but not equal to 3. Right? That's the difference between the two concepts. It is, uh, the first one is the, the actual value of the function. The second one is the value which is approached along the curve when x is near 3, but not exactly equal to 3. All right, uh, let's just look at an example on a picture here. I'll go to the next page. No. On a picture. I'll use 3 here. I've been using x equal 3 the whole time. How about this function? This is one of those weird functions which has a jump in it. Uh, this is, sorry, that's not what I meant. I meant this. All right. I would like to know what is f of 3 and what is lim x goes to 3 of f of x. So f of 3, it means you look at x value 3 and you say what the y value is when x equals 3. Can anyone say? And shout it out. It is 2, yeah. You see the empty dot and the filled in dot? I hope you're familiar with this, uh, this notation. The empty dot means actually the value is not there. Instead, it is up here where the filled in dot is. So the y value when x equals 3, you use the filled in dot, which is at 2. I guess I didn't label these, but... It's 2. f of 3 equals 2. All right? Lim x goes to 3 of f of x. That means you look instead, come on, instead of right at this point, you look at all the nearby values, which are not exactly 3, but very close to 3. That is, you look along the curve near this point, although not right at that point, and you say, where do the values approach nearby? along the curve. What do you think? Yeah, I would say one. I heard a grunt, which sounded like one, right? So this is, they are different, right? And the way you look at them differently is you look at the exact point. Whereas if it says limb, you look along the curve near the point. Right? So the reason that the limit is 1 is because the curve is going to y equals 1, even though at that specific point you have the empty circle. And so the value at that specific point is not 1, it's 2. But the limit is approaching 1 along the curve. All right? Another way that people say this, and you can say this if you want to, another way people uh, explain what does that mean, they say something like, when x is really, really close to 3, then y is really, really close to 1, right? This is uh, maybe, I, I remember when I was in high school, I did a little bit of this in high school. I was not on any kind of math fast track, but um, I learned about limits in high school. And this time my teacher explained it to me. That thing in the red box, it means that when the x value is really close to 3, the y value is really close to 1. All right? And I felt like I understood that. It made sense. OK. Um, now, in this particular example, those two answers were different, the 2 and the 1, right? Uh, that actually is not usually the case. Uh, on a typical example that you're going to see in a, in a class like this, usually, they are the same. So I'm going to say usually the value at the point is the same as the value uh, along the curve, right? Uh, for example, um, if I showed you this graph, this is just x squared. Um, you know, if I go to 2 here, I end up at 4 up here, right? Uh, can we say, what is f of 2 
Here's two. Versus what is lim x goes to two of f of x. All right. The first one says just what is the y value when I use x equals two? Uh, the answer would be two squared, which is four, right? The second one says, where is the y value along the curve as I'm approaching x equals two? What do you think? You want to shout it out? Yeah, it's also four. As you approach along the curve, it's just going to go to the same place that, that that point already is. So this one is also four, all right? What I said here, usually the value at the point is the same as the value along the curve. And really, the only time when this wouldn't happen is in a you know, strange example like this, where there's some kind of empty circle, filled in circle, or some kind of weird jumpy jump in the function. But, but usually that doesn't happen, right? Usually there is no jumpy jump in the function, and so the value is just the same, the value at the point is the same as the value that the curve is going to, all right? Um, all right, I want some for you guys to try out. I know it's been a lot of just sitting here listening to me. Uh, sorry, can I say one more thing before I have you guys try one? Sometimes the limit as you approach a specific point doesn't exist. That is to say, sometimes there, there just isn't any limit. Uh, for example, uh, if I had something like f of x equals 1 over x minus 2, perhaps, this looks like, if you graph this, you will see, it looks like that. This is actually the graph of 1 over x, but shifted to the right by 2. Um, what is lim x approaches 2 of f of x? What do you think? It doesn't exist. Yes, it does not exist. Uh, can you say why? Yeah, I would say as the x, what I want to ask is when the x is nearby this number, which is 2 is right here, right? When the x is near 2, what y value does the curve get near 2? And my answer would be the curve doesn't get close to any y value. Right? There is no particular value where this curve is going to, right? Over here, it's going, like, you could say it's going up to positive infinity. And over here, it's going down to minus infinity. There's no coherent value. There's no y value that the curve is actually approaching like a specific number. It's just not, it's not approaching a specific number. And so we say this limit does not exist. That's because the curve does not approach any particular y value. Does not approach a specific y value. Right? It just doesn't. It like. It goes up to infinity, you might say, from one side. On the other side, it goes down to minus infinity. In any case, it doesn't approach any particular value. All right? I'm going to write for does not exist. I'm usually going to write this DNE, the limit does not exist. That's what DNE stands for. So when I ask you, you know, on a homework or something, what's the limit of whatever, whatever, sometimes the answer will be a number, because the, the limit typically represents a y value. Or sometimes the answer will be DNE, the limit does not exist. All right. Okay, I got some for you to try just by looking at a picture. See what you think. I hope your picture, I hope you're able to copy my picture. Well, doesn't matter. As long as you can see my picture. Building dot there, one of these, and it goes down like that. All right, and I would like you, based on this picture, to find a bunch of things here. F of 2, also lim x approaches 2, f of x. Also f of 3, also lim x approaches 3, f of x. Uh, and the same at 5, f of 5, and then x approaches 5, f of x. All right, see what you think. I will give you a few moments to think about it. In each case, you should be able to just read the answer off the picture, although you got to 
keep it straight what you're looking for. And in some cases, the answer may be DNE. Feel free to talk to your friends about it. Six. Let's do that too. Yeah, you would have to estimate F of five. Sorry. I give you two more minutes, then let's talk about them. Wait till it says 255. All right, it says 255. Let's talk about them. Uh, so these, uh, come on, all right. How about f of 2? What did you say? Someone can shout it out. Or show me the fingers. 2, yeah. You look right at, uh, here's x equal 2. The y value, you use the dot rather than the empty one, and you choose 2. So this, I hope you said 2. How about lim x goes to 2? That means you look at the values along the curve near x equal 2. What do you say? 1, all right. Excellent. Okay, how about f of 3? That means you go over to x equal 3, which is here. f of 3 means what is the y value? 0. Zero. Uh -huh. Lim x goes to 3. Where does the curve go to the y value along the curve? Is also 0. Yeah. All right. Everybody knows this. How about f of 5? Okay, I didn't mean to ask you that, but um, 
Yeah, what I meant, it occurs to me now, what I meant is to ask you about uh, four, right? This is more interesting than five. Uh, anyway, we can do this. F of five, what would it be? You look at the Y value of five, which is here, I guess you'd have to estimate that. Maybe one and a half. 1.6 maybe? It looks a little higher. I don't care how, uh, how you chose to estimate that. And then what about the limit? Is it the same or is it different? It's the same, yeah, because at that point, there's no funny business going on with the curve. The value at the point is the same as where the curve is going to. So here, whatever you guess the first time around should also be the same answer again. Okay, and then what about six? What did you say for f of six? Yeah, I would say there is no f of six on this picture. f of six means what is the y value right here when x equals six? And the answer is that there is no y value right there. So this, I would say, does not exist. And how about the limit as x approaches 6? What do you say? Also does not exist, I would say, because the, the curve does not approach any particular y value. Uh, some people said negative infinity. You can say that if you want to. I know what you mean. What you mean is the y values actually go down forever as you approach x equals 6. And that, that would be fine, too. In this situation, for now at least, I'm going to say BNE. Can I say a little technicality? This is something I don't know if, if any of you are, are transgressing here. Just for grammatical reasons, when I write this DNE, I notice I did not write the equal sign. This is like a pet peeve of mine. It's, it slightly annoys me when people say e equals DNE because that's not like grammatically correct f of 6 does not exist. You would never say f of 6 equals does not exist. That doesn't make sense. Do be, you do you. But uh, I'm, just, I'll, I'm just telling you. OK, I meant to ask you about 4. Let's do f of 4 and lim x goes to 4 f of x. That's this point here. x equals 4 is right here. What would you say, f of 4? Looks like negative 1. You have really two choices, the empty dot or the filled in dot. But that's the point of the dots. Uh, they mean you choose the filled in dot, right? When it's f of whatever, you choose the filled in dot, which in this case would be minus 1. And how about limit as x goes to 4 of f of x? Yeah, in this situation, you say the limit does not exist because there is no specific y value that the curve is approaching here. You might say, isn't, it, isn't the curve approaching negative 1? And it, it kind of is, but I would also say the curve is also approaching 2, if you look on this side, all right? The curve uh, on the either side, on the left side, it's going down here. On the right side, it's going up here. Anyway, in such a situation, if I ask you, what is the limit? That means, what is the specific y value which is being approached? And the answer is, there is no one specific y value. So this does not exist, all right? Now, we are going to talk uh, next time about limits. You should feel like, in that case, well, you could say, what about the limit on one side versus the limit on the other side? They, they do exist individually. Um, those are called the one-sided limits, which I don't really want to get into right now. But we will talk about that eventually. All right, any questions about that? I hope that this example seems clear to everybody. It seemed like uh, everybody was doing, doing great. I hope that you are doing great. I'm doing great. Um, all right, I just wanted to talk about two more similar kinds of things. Um, so that was an example where you're just looking at the graph the whole time. If you're just looking at the graph, you can basically, if you know what to look for, you just look and find the uh, limits. No problem if you know what you're looking for. Um, how about if I'm giving you a formula? With formulas, um, we are going to talk about how to do this algebraically. But at this point, I will just remind you that you can always compute these limits using a calculator or by graphing things on a calculator. For example, if I have, let's say, what if I ask you, what is the limb as x approaches uh, 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1? How about that? Um, we're going to learn some tricks for how to evaluate limits like this in a, uh, next time. But for now, I'm just going to say we can try to work this out. We can try this using a calculator. What it means is 
find me the y value when the x is really close to 1 and see what it approaches. So um, you could try, you just try x values close to 1. So maybe I'm going to try, uh, let's say, x equals 1.5 and then try x equals 1, how about 1.01. If I'm using a calculator, you might as well use something really super close to uh, x equals 1. And just see what you get as the answer and see if those answers actually approach any particular value. When I did this, um, all you do is you plug that x value into the formula that's written there. So I'm going to just use 1.5 in the formula. I go 1.5 squared minus 1 divided by 1.5 minus 1, right? And what do you get? Well, I did this on my calculator. You can trust me. I get 2.5 when I compute everything out. And then you could try 1.01 when I plug that in. It's 1.01 squared minus 1 divided by 1.01 minus 1. And when I plug that in, I got 2.01. All right. And you could continue this by choosing numbers closer and closer to 1 for the x values. I'll just say etc. Everybody, you know how you could do this if you had to on your calculator. And I'm just going to say it looks like these values are approaching 2. Looks like the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 equals 2, right? And if you're using a calculator, this is really as good as you can do in terms of you try some values and you sort of see what it seems that they are approaching. You might ask yourself, why am I wasting my time with values really close to 1? Why don't I actually just use 1 and plug that in? Won't that give me the, uh, the answer? Well, in this example, you can't. So just, I will ask you to observe. I will say note. You can't just use x equal 1. Because what, what would happen if I tried to plug in x equals 1 to that, that original formula? I would get 1 squared minus 1 over 1 minus 1. And this is 0 divided by 0, which is not anything, right? You're not allowed to ever divide by 0. And you certainly can't make any sense out of 0 divided by 0. So this is nothing. That's why you can't just use x equals 1 in the first place. You have to choose numbers which are close to 1 but not the same as 1 if you want to get any number at all, all right? OK, so it looks like this limit is 2. That's all I'm saying. Um, here's another example I just wanted to show you. You can also try to do this on a graph, again, using a calculator or a computer or something. You can just graph the function and then try and see where it goes to. So you could also graph it. Here's a, another example. How about lim x goes to 0 of sine x divided by x? All right. Again, we're going to learn some techniques to figure these limits out eventually without using a calculator. Although this one in particular is very hard to do. If you knew, maybe when you looked at the other one, you remembered, oh yeah, I know how to figure out that limit without using my calculator. This one is, um, is quite difficult. Uh, we're going to talk about it, but it, it involves some, some kind of serious tricks. Um, Again, the problem here is you cannot plug in exactly x equals 0. So you can't plug in x equals 0. That's because what you would get would be sine of 0 divided by 0. Sine of 0, anyone remember? What's sine of 0? Any trig masters out there? Yeah. Any other trig masters out there? It's 0, yeah. It was one of those, right? Uh, this is 0 over 0. Yes, thank you for uh, volunteering your mastery. Um, yeah, sine of 0 is 0. I hope you remember things like that for the quiz on Friday. Um, that could be on the quiz. Anyway, again, we are in the situation where you get 0 over 0, which doesn't mean anything. So that exact value, x equals 0, cannot be plugged in to give you any sensible answer. So instead, you could graph it just using a calculator. And look at values near 0, right? And just see what you get. Uh, I'm going to use my grapher on here. I have an app. Um, I'll, I'll just say you can use whatever graphing 
calculator or whatever that you want. I use something called Desmos. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. It's a website, which is really great. And it also they also have a, a free app that you can get. It's like really free. No ads, no nothing, no nonsense. Um, this, I have, I'm back. I said that for the folks at home watching the YouTube. Um, let me just say, it looks like uh, when x is near 0, the y is near 1. All right, so at least according to the graph, it seems like this limit, x goes to 0 of sine x over x, equals 1. All right? And in fact, it really does equal 1. Like I said before, we're going to learn some tricks to be able to evaluate limits in general. This one is quite difficult, but we will, we will talk about it at least once. Um, the limit really does equal 1 for that function. All right. These tricks are what we're going to uh, focus on next time. And I think I might as well leave it at that. I know we got five more minutes, but let's leave it there. All right. See you all next time. Let me know. You know, we got five more minutes. I'd be happy to talk about homework if anybody has questions about the homework. Um, otherwise, I'll see you all tomorrow.